I want you to hit me as hard as you can. The 1970s, the age of disco and gonorrhea. It was also the age of the birth of superheroes in film and TV. I know, I know, you're all going to say that was the Batman 60s TV show with Adam West that was the real birth of superheroes in TV and film. Maybe you'll even mention the old superhero movie serials from the 1940s and early 50s. But let's be honest, it wasn't until Christopher Reeve put on that red cape that people began to see comic book characters in a new light. Yet even though the big screen capes and tights were a huge hit, that wasn't so much the case in television. But it wasn't for a lack of trying. Marvel Comics led the charge to dominate the television screen, but for the most part the results ranged from not so great to downright embarrassing. But the one success, the one show that made it work, even though it didn't exactly follow the source material, was The Incredible Hulk. The series lasted from 1977 to 1982 and starred the incredibly talented Bill Bixby, who I was actually a fan of since my favorite Martian. No, not that piece of garbage! It also starred former Mr. Universe Lou Ferrigno as the world breaker himself, the Incredible Hulk. But while the Hulk was portrayed by Ferrigno, his voice, or rather growls, were provided by both Ted Cassidy until his death in 1979, and then by Charles Napier for the rest of the series. The Incredible Hulk is a classic among Marvel adaptations. It lasted a total of five seasons, with its pilot episode also being shown in theaters overseas, and becoming the highest grossing film in Europe in the fall of 1977. It's amazing that this show has endured for decades as a fan favorite, considering that it's not exactly that close to the source material or its obvious goofs. Two things that hardcore comic book fans would jump down someone's throat for nowadays. But does this TV show hold up as we all fondly remember it? Can we get past the 1970s cheese? And do you really want to? Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. In this episode of Gone But Not Forgotten. The Incredible Hulk TV series was the brainchild of Kenneth Johnson, who also created the sci-fi series V and the Bionic Woman. He also went on to create one of my favorite forgotten sci-fi gems, Alien Nation. Hmm, yep, I'm putting that one on the list. Johnson was offered a number of Marvel characters to adapt to TV. He seemed like an ideal choice after all, seeing as the Bionic Woman was a smash hit. But there was one problem, Johnson hated comic books. Now I know I sound like I'm saying that only comic book fans can play a comic book character or make a movie about one, but that's not true. There are plenty of great movies made by people who are not familiar with comics or maybe even hate them. But Johnson really did not like the history of the Hulk and refused to take the job at first, but eventually changed his mind when he was reading Victor Hugo's Les Miserables and got inspired. He decided to make Banner into Jean Valjean on the run from the main antagonist reporter Jack McGee, his Javert. Once he came up with that idea, he wrote the script in a week. Since Johnson was so detached from the source material, he discarded the Hulk's entire supporting cast. No Rick Jones, no Betty Ross, no General Thunderbolt Ross, hell, not even Major Talbot. Johnson also pushed really hard for the Hulk to be red, but luckily Marvel put their foot down and refused. Can you imagine a red Hulk? That's probably the stupidest thing I have ever heard of. And of course, I can't talk about this show without talking about the most infamous change, changing Bruce Banner's name to David Banner. Allegedly, Johnson and the network, or just the network, thought that Bruce was too much of a gay name. Johnson denies this, and says that he did it because he didn't like that Stan Lee liked to name his characters with the same initials. For example, Peter Parker, Reed Richards, and Bruce Banner. He says he wanted to change it so that people wouldn't think it was a comic book TV show but later went on to say that he changed it to honor his son. However, both Stan Lee and Lou Ferrigno say that the change was due to homophobia, and I tend to lean towards Stan and Lou's story. It just sounds too stupid not to be true. At least they gave him Bruce as a middle name. Still, for all the bitching I'm doing right now, I have to admit that the changes to how he became the Hulk are actually for the better. If you don't know the comic book origin of the Hulk, it goes as follows. Dr. Bruce Banner, a scientist who created an experimental gamma bomb, is hit by its explosion after he runs out into the field by the bomb site to save a teenager named Rick Jones, who has gone into the restricted area to win a dare from his friends. 
Bruce throws Rick into a safety ditch while he gets hit by the blast and turns into the Hulk. Now let's put aside the fact that atomic bombs don't work that way, and that he would have been reduced to dust. At best, Rick Jones would have died horribly from cancer. But the mere fact that Banner even saved him boggles my mind. It's a freaking bomb! It has one purpose, to kill people! What did you expect to happen? Shouldn't you know that bombs are used to kill? You're a goddamn scientist! Personally, I think that the new origin for the TV show was far better. Here, David Banner is still grieving over the death of his wife at the hands of a car accident that left him helpless to save her. David is frustrated that he didn't have the strength to lift the car, to rip the doors off, or to just have the ability to have done anything to save her life. Banner decides to test himself after discovering that gamma radiation from solar flares has given super strength to people in life or death situations, and doses himself with gamma radiation. But though he believes it was a small dose, the machine's gauges weren't calibrated correctly, and he actually absorbs a million times higher amount of radiation than what he originally thought. Now, as a backstory, this is a million times better. It grounds the character in reality. It was smart. People wouldn't be dismissing this as a kid's show. Remember, this was pre-Blade. The dark times, when we lived in the shadows. When our ways were mocked and ridiculed. But then we came out of the shadows, and we lived again! Other changes were made with a similar mindset. The Hulk's strength was reduced, and he only growled. This was changed so as to not alienate a wider audience, and I also suspect because of budgetary reasons. I mean, we can't exactly have the Hulk lifting up a plane on just a TV budget. The pilot episode actually holds up surprisingly well, and I can see why it was shown in theaters, as it has a pretty brisk pace. If you've seen any 70s TV, you'll know that everything goes at a snail's pace, where characters talk to themselves, repeating exposition over and over again, just so the audience doesn't get lost. Anger. Elena, I was angry and upset. And last night I was angry too. I left the lab, I was, so, I was so totally frustrated because of our, our failure with the research, and then there was, there was the, the rain, the storm, the flat tire. And when I blacked out, I remember I was furious. Everybody got that? The pilot starts off by showing the accident that killed David's wife. Boy, you've gotta love those days when seatbelts were just a suggestion. To think that the Hulk could have been avoided if Dr. Banner had just seen a Crash Test Dummies commercial. One, two, one, two. Banner is haunted by his wife's death and throws himself into his work alongside his partner, Dr. Elena Marks, played by Susan Sullivan, who I was always a fan of ever since I saw her on Dharma and Greg. The two of them interview people who perform feats of great strength, and one late night, David figures out that during those times of extreme stress, the sun flares of gamma radiation are what cause the super strength. And after he shoots himself full of radiation, he throws a hissy fit like a baby when he has problems changing a tire in the rain. And it's here that he turns into a badly painted bodybuilder who apparently hates cars. Did you know that it took three hours to paint Lou Ferrigno into this makeup? Though apparently someone was a little impatient in the makeup chair. We're next introduced to Jack McGee, as played by veteran television actor Jack Colvin. Colvin portrayed McGee as a very driven individual. Yes, he was portrayed as a bit of a weasel in the pilot episode, but Colvin would later play a more like an obsessive detective. He just became consumed with uncovering secrets, which made him an amazing reporter, but would eventually cost him his life. We see this in his last appearance in the 80s TV movie, The Incredible Hulk Returns, where he's portrayed as being pretty much unemployed and a laughingstock with his fellow reporters due to his obsession with the Hulk. The pilot ends tragically, as McGee accidentally causes an accident that kills Dr. Marks, and sadly the Hulk is blamed for not only her death, but David Banner's as well. This is the linchpin of the series, as Banner goes on the run, with Banner getting into adventures while trying to find a cure to his condition and defeating McGee. The second episode is a perfect example of how the show will run throughout the series. Here David winds up saving an heiress of a winery? A pineapple farm? Uh, they never say, but it doesn't matter. Basically, this girl's stepmom is trying to kill her by poisoning her slowly for her money, and David tries to save the girl, but he gets punched in the head with a metal pot. He then turns into the Hulk and runs out to save her. Then you have the far goofier moments of the show, like when the Hulk ends up starring in a National Geographic special. Ah, 
are the North American brown bear. What majestic creature, known in the wild as nature's most confusing stuffed animal. While many believe that they like porridge or have names from alternate universes, in truth, they prefer soup. Ah, and here comes the Incredible Hulk, a bear's natural rival. See how the bear begins to take the color of the green behemoth as the two fight it out, which may look like a friendly hug. But then the bear realizes that he will suffer the fate that most bears have whilst fighting the Incredible Hulk, and that is of being thrown in the air and taking the form of a badly made bear doll. Another great thing that this show produced was some stellar advice, such as... Hi. Hi. Where are you headed? North, Carson City. I don't usually do this, but you look trustworthy. Hop in. Thanks. Look, uh, maybe this is out of line, and I don't mean it as a come on, but uh, I could really use someone to travel with. I mean, a girl alone on the road's bad enough, and with this creature running around, I'm really scared. And they never saw them again. But hey, at least the show has taught me what to do when someone gets bitten by a snake. I need a tourniquet. What next? Got to get the poison out. Here, take this. Cut across the bite. <laughs> well, that probably caused the rates of snake bite deaths to go up in the 1970s. And David Banner was always putting himself in stupid situations like this, such as in an episode titled 747, where David Banner makes the dumbest decision possible. He gets on a freaking airplane. Now, you're a fucking scientist, David. What do you expect to happen? You're just gonna chill in your seat eating peanuts? No, you're going to wind up on a plane where an evil pilot teams up with an evil stewardess as played by Alan's mom from the Hangover movies, and the two of them drug the other pilots so they can steal Egyptian artifacts. That belongs in a museum. I know it belongs in a museum. Then you're going to Hulk out, knock out the evil pilot so that you'll have to land the plane yourself, and Hulk out as you land, leaving the Hulk to stop the plane on the runway by pressing the brake! However, there is one joke in this episode which made me laugh for over a minute. Anybody there? Now you've got to admit how smart Banner was that he could get a job doing anything on this show. He was a bartender, a valet, an arcade manager slash repairman, a sports doctor, and a zookeeper. And that last job had some deadly consequences when the Hulk transformed back into Banner at the worst possible moment. <laughs> I'm just screwing with you. I'm not letting you off that easy. The Incredible Hulk is an admittedly dated show, with episodes desperately trying to cash in on the latest crazes. A disco episode, a black exploitation episode, and even a kung fu episode. It also featured appearances by future stars like Ernie Hudson, Kim Cattrall, and Mako. The show was eventually cancelled in 1982, and again, it had nothing to do with the show itself. According to an interview with Kenneth Johnson, the new head of CBS at the time, Harvey Shepard, wanted to make a name for himself by beginning to cancel shows, even though they had good ratings, just because he didn't get them. Still, for all the fun I've made of it, The Incredible Hulk had some solid episodes. There's Broken Mirror, an episode where David meets his doppelganger, a ruthless crook named Mike Cassidy. Bill Bixby playing a badass gangster. Sign me up! Then there's Prometheus, where David Banner encounters a meteor that emits gamma radiation, which causes him to get stuck in mid-transformation. 
but my personal favorite is the first. In this episode, David Banner goes to a town that had a report of a Hulk decades ago, and finds out about a professor who before he died created a gamma machine that provides a cure for the Hulk condition. He meets the professor's lab assistant, who turns out to be the Beta Hulk, and the assistant uses the machine to turn himself back into Beta Hulk and goes on a murderous rampage. David decides that in order to stop Beta Hulk, he has to cure the assistant, and has two injections so that he can cure himself after taking out the Beta Hulk. So he injects the assistant with the dose needed to cure him, but the assistant turns into Beta Hulk before it takes effect and starts trashing the lab. And here's the reason I love this episode. It's not that it's a Hulk versus Hulk battle, that's cool and all, but no. The reason I love this episode is because of this scene. That is Bill Bixby just crushing it. Remember, this was kind of a goofy show, and I'm sure many actors would have written this show off and just phoned in their performance here. But Bixby just poured so much emotion into that one scene. His despair, his frustration, and anger exploding onto the screen. I feel like I have just witnessed a man break. And I don't believe David Banner recovered after this. I think that he continued to pursue a cure, sure. But deep down, he knew that he would never find it. The show also spun off into some cool TV movies. Everybody knows about The Trial of the Incredible Hulk, which has the on-screen debut of Daredevil, but there was also The Incredible Hulk Returns, featuring the on-screen debut of Thor. And finally, there was The Death of the Incredible Hulk, which hit the airways on February 18th, 1990, where we finally said goodbye to David Banner and the Hulk. It's my least favorite of the Incredible Hulk TV movies, but it's for a lot of reasons that I won't get into here. And on a sadder note, Bill Bixby died a few short years later, which permanently closed the door for a future continuation of the show. So, how could this show even come back? Well, I am going to say one word, and it's a word that may be triggering to some of you, so I need all of you to take a deep breath and try to keep sharp objects away from your computer or phone screen. Reboot. <laughs> okay guys, chill. It's obvious that the Incredible Hulk TV show cannot live without Bill Bixby. I mean, theoretically you could recast Banner and have a new actor co-star with Ferrigno. But yeah, as for Lou Ferrigno, I'm not going to talk bad about the guy. All I will say is that you must always pay him for a picture at comic book conventions. Even if you take a picture and Lou Ferrigno happens to be behind you, fuck you, pay Ferrigno. Even if you ask for a picture of him for charity, fuck you, pay Ferrigno. Even if you have cancer and he is your one make-a-wish, fuck you, pay Lou Ferrigno for his fucking picture. Because if you don't, that will make him angry. And you wouldn't like Lou Ferrigno when he's angry. So okay, see if you can follow me here. What if the main premise kind of stays the same, with Bruce Banner now on the run from not just Jack McGee, but also General Thunderbolt Ross? And we could have Betty Ross helping Bruce stay one step ahead of them. I know it's a leap, but if we can finally get ourselves a She-Hulk TV show, I think it's a decent idea. In spite of its flaws, The Incredible Hulk still paved the way for future Marvel universes, both cinematic and television. If it wasn't for that instantly iconic intro and the beautiful end credits piano theme, we would be significantly worse off as a culture. Hell, we would instead be watching Steel 3 Return of the Shack. So if you feel like watching some good old 1970s TV for a hit of nostalgia, just go on Amazon Prime or buy the DVD box set to be able to see Hulk smash. It's not easy being green Having to spend each day the color of the leaves When I think it might be nicer being red or yellow or gold or something much more colorful like that.